closed and the commission will discuss and vote on the issue. All comments are to be germane to the item under consideration and speakers are to maintain a courteous manner. Items listed on the consent portion of the agenda will not be individually discussed and will be considered for approval in accordance with the recommendation in the staff report unless an individual present or member of the commission requests the item be removed from consent and considered separately under the public hearing agenda. Can I have a motion to approve the minutes of the August 4th, 2022 meeting? Thank you, Dory. All in favor, please raise your right hand. Opposed or abstained? Thank you. I will now read the consent public hearing items. Number one, request from Liberty Holdings, owner 1626 Dixon Street, represented by Jeff Tucker, regarding the vacation of the easternmost 255 lineal feet of the east-west right-of-way of East Jefferson Ave, located to the west of Dixon Street. Is there anyone on the commission who wishes to hear this item tonight? Anyone in the public? This will remain on consent. Number two is a request from Holt Sales and Services represented by Josh Holt for review and approval of a public hearing site plan HSI Duratech building addition for property at 2615 Dean Ave for a and for a type two design alternative to allow a garage loading entrance on the primary facade of the proposed workshop warehouse type building where it is only allowed on rear or interior side facade. Um, and just a note on this one, staff receive, uh, the staff recommendation did require additional landscaping for screening the property on the east side. So, and the applicant did agree to that. So we just wanted to make that note. Is there anyone on the commission who would like to hear this item? Anyone in the public? All right, number two will remain on consent. Number three, a request from RM Madden Construction represented by Michael Madden for review and approval of a public hearing site plan for property at 4200 Southeast 17th Street and for type two design alternative to allow construction of a house type B in the N3A neighborhood district with a waiver of the requirement for installation of public sidewalk along street frontages. Is there anyone on the commission who wishes to hear this item? Anyone in the public? Number three will remain on consent. Number four, a request from University Storage LLC represented by Will Matthews for review and approval of a public hearing site plan Cube Smart Storage on East University for property located in the vicinity of 1901 East University Ave and for type two design alternatives, um, just A, allow buildings with 0% transparency per code on a street facing facade when the requirement is 12% per story. Is there anyone on the commission who wants to hear this item? Anyone in the public? So we have items one through four on the consent agenda. Do I have a motion to move consent? I'll move. Thank you, Abby. All in favor, please raise your right hand. Motion carries 10-0. Thank you, Jason. We will now move on to public hearing items. Item number five is continued from the July 21, 2022 meeting. It is a request from Mr. Salah for a review and approval of a pub public hearing site plan ice cream shop for the property located at 3510 Cottage Grove Ave and for the type two design alternatives A and B. And Michael will be presenting this item. Good evening, Madam Chair, members of the Commission, Michael Delp, Planning Staff. The applicant here is uh, proposing a project at 3510 Cottage Grove Avenue. He is requesting review and approval of the public's 
public hearing site plan ice cream shop at 3510 Cottage Grove Avenue and for the following type 2 design alternatives. Reduction of the required primary frontage coverage, coverage from 85% to 23% and waive the requirement to meet the non-primary frontage bill to zone of 0 to 10 feet along 35th Street. Here is an aerial of the parcel here. It is at the intersection of Cottage Grove Avenue and 30, 35th Street. Um, the parcel contains uh, 7,050 uh, square feet and is 0 0.162 acres. The existing use on site is a vacant surface lot and the current uh, zoning district is MX1. <clears throat> And just to provide some context of what they're proposing here on site in terms of the ice cream shop, the building is located here on the southwest corner of the lot with a parking oriented towards Cottage Grove Avenue and uh, 30, uh, sorry, 37th here. Um, the garbage on the back end of here is oriented towards the alleyway. Um, their primary frontage here is onto Cottage Grove with their primary entrance here. Um, they have parking oriented here towards the south on the lot. Here are, are some elevations just to give you an idea of what they're proposing in terms of building. Um, they'll have a uh, patio here and a balcony oriented towards the eastern part of the um, building towards the parking lot um, on the eastern portion of the building. Just some more to show you an example of what's being proposed. So for our staff recommendation on this property, um, it is a storefront building type. Um, that's what it's going under for our building typologies. Um, for storefront building types, um, there is a maximum uh, primary frontage coverage uh, requirements per the building type uh, regulation. I'm kind of going around here, sorry about that. Um, there's a requirement for a maximum 85% primary frontage coverage. They're trying to decrease that amount to 23%. Um, staff's opinion on this is it isn't feasible to meet this primary frontage coverage given the nature of the parcel. Um, and to allow for surface parking lot within the uh, parcel for the building type. For their non-primary frontage built to zone, um, staff believes that siting the building in the north uh, east corner of the parcel will allow the building and the use to, to access the full pedestrian realm, meeting that full 0 to 10 foot distance um, and having the patio oriented towards the sidewalks on each side would um, fully fully access the pedestrian realm for the uh, uh, walkability of the neighborhood. Um, traditionally in the Drake neighborhood too, there are uh, corner store buildings with their parking oriented in the rear lot um, and staff recommendation would be to have the uh, building oriented in the northeast corner and the parking lot behind oriented towards the alleyway. So staff recommends the approval of the reduction of the primary frontage coverage from 85% to 23%. Um, we recommend denial on waiving the uh, Bill 2 zone of 0 to 10 feet on the non-primary frontage Bill 2 zone. Here were some uh, concerns that we received from the neighborhood organization, the Drake Neighborhood Organization. Um, there was concerns about um, a two-story building and having it block their view of the street. Um, concerns were expressed with the increased car traffic um, on the already busy street there. Um, the neighborhood had already requested a traffic study on 31st to get a pedestrian walkway. Um, so they're, incre they're worried about the increased traffic with the building um, placement there. Um, there was some concern about the placement of the alleyway um, on the back end in the southwest corner of the uh, proposed plan also. Um, there was a concern about future use also um, that was given by the neighborhood. 
and we did not receive any comments. Any questions? Can you go back to the site plan for a sec? Sure. I'm wondering how far from the north property line the building is proposed? So it's w within the zero to five foot built to zone. Um, they're not meeting the zero to 10 foot required on the nine primary frontage um, coverage here on oh, the other street. You want to shift it all the way to the east? Correct. It'll be in the northeast corner here. That's what staff is recommending. Um, it's currently meeting the zero to five foot built to zone for storefront requirements. Um, it is not meeting the zero to 10. So ideally it would be in this northeast corner meeting the zero to 10 foot uh, built to zone and the zero to five foot built to zone. So I guess I'm, I'm sort of the same. So right now there is a parking lot there. Are they talking about disturbing the parking lots that's there with the building in this current plan? And we're proposing we're going to take that whole parking lot out and build a new one that may also not have two logical entries for traffic flow and instead have another parking lot that may have parking density challenges and parking entry and exit challenges? So I believe the existing uh, proposed site layout is to maximize the parking that's existing there with the entrances onto both primary streets. Um, they're wanting to site the building back here to um, use the green space that's current, currently existing. Is that alleyway usable so you could have two entry and exits as is sort of proposed here with this limited parking setup? Um, it's currently a gravel parking lot. Um, I don't think we'd Th want they access could, off of there. Yeah, they could, a um, couple things to be looked at. I think it, um, I, I wouldn't presume that one driveway wouldn't be adequate, but I, also, we have had commercial development that kind of is in a neighborhood setting where they've improved the alley and used that part of the alley. So I think if, if in fact, we came back with a site plan, um, I would expect that that would be part of the dialogue and, 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 and looked at would be just how that all flows and whether or not it can be done on site. But that would be an option that we've done elsewhere. <clears throat> And just to piggyback, I, I, I recognize there's parking there now, but there's no building there now. From our perspective on the planning side, uh, we look, this is new development. We do respect that they are trying to um, utilize, I, I have no, no problem you know, understanding the intent or the desire to utilize what's there just to minimize cost. Um, but we thought from our perspective that the, the, the notion of having the building out at the corner, which is what the if you read the description of a storefront building, uh, if you look at the character of the Drake, broader Drake neighborhood, um, that is more fitting in our mind to kind of fit within that character. It's also obviously the way the design standards have been constructed uh, for this district, um, that that building should be out there. And so since it's brand new development, other than some existing paving versus renovating an existing building, we felt it was appropriate to do so with that, you know, that, that could be achieved. And I'm assuming they're opposed to shifting the building to the other place and doing a whole new parking lot? Correct. And did they identify the cost impact to you? What's your opinion of the cost impact? Um, they have not. Okay. All right, any other questions? Thanks, Michael. Yeah. Is the applicant present? Please state your name, address. You have 10 minutes, and then just sign in when you're done. Uh, Patrick Shepard, Civil Engineering Consultants, 2486th Street in Urbandale. Sorry, could you speak into the microphone? I'm sorry. Oh, 
Yeah, maybe. I guess we can't. <laughs> All right. I can. That works. Oh. I tried. There we go. All right. Um, I want to point out how isolated this uh, particular MX1 site is. It's right there at the southwest corner of Cottage Grove and 35th. Um, and if you look at an entire area from University Avenue to 235 and from 28th over to 42nd, other than the shops at Roosevelt, this is the only MX1 property in, the, in that entire area. Uh, it's predominantly residential. There are some heavier uses up along University, as would be expected. Uh, there's a few churches in the area, but as you travel from Cottage Grove to four, from 42nd to 28th, and 35th from University to um, down past Kingman. It's predominantly residential um, with, with large, it was a little bigger area than what we saw earlier, but um, so there's some pretty large setbacks. Um, most of these houses are probably at least 25 feet. There's several you know, along Cottage Grove, the entire length of that street that are probably closer to 40 or 50. Um, setbacks get pretty large as you go south along 35th. And those three structures that exist at this intersection, uh, the two homes and the church are all about 35 to 45 feet away from the intersection of the sidewalk. So we feel placing this building up, in, you know, cramming this building up in the corner would look out of place at that wide open intersection. And as you're traveling south on 35th, it's going to block the view of those houses to the south. Um, a little history on the site. This, there was a building on this site that was torn down in um, 2014, and according to the county appraiser, that building was built in 1930. So a building has existed uh, exactly where we want to put our building for 84 of the last 92 years. So that was in uh, 2000. It looks like there was a house on the lot also. 2001, the house is gone. It was in uh, 2009. The parking lot was just constructed in 2007, I believe, um, for the businesses that were there at the time. There's another parking lot that shows the uh, parking being used. So, I mean, to us, it seemed like a logical place to put the building. We consider this kind of redevelopment. Since it was, you know, building there for so long, the parking lot's been there. Uh, it's in great shape. It would serve our purpose. Uh, it provides the required amount of parking stalls for what we are proposing for this type of use in this zoning. Um, you know, the environmentally conscious thing to do would be to use what's there. I don't think redevelopment means take everything down to the ground and haul half the stuff to the a dump site or the landfill somewhere. Uh, and it also increases, you know, expenses for the owner. If the parking lot's there and can be used, um, you know, why not incorporate that into your site? And that's kind of what it looks like now. And the building was, like I said, it was taken out in 2014. So from 2015 on, it's looked like that. We're not proposing to make any changes, too many changes to the parking lot. We are have to remove like a three or four foot strip along the north side of the lot to provide the seven foot buffer required along Cottage Grove, and then um, doing that would cause us to put in that same amount on the south side. So we keep the same amount of parking from north to south. So here are some you know, photos of what the building looked like back in 1999. Uh, got a brick facade. I think that, you know, that's a seven foot door. This building was probably at least 18 to 20 foot tall on the front. In the early 2000s, it was uh, Mission Oak Gallery. You can see the facade sticks up. It's probably, what, 18, 24 feet. And then the other side there on the east side of the building is probably in the 16 to 18 foot range. Our building is a one-story building, um, 16 feet all the way around. Brick on all four sides. Just a couple more over the years. You know, nice brick storefront, plenty of glass facing Cottage Grove uh, with the outdoor seating. 
uh, patio and the deck above. Out of the intersection, see how wide open it is. Um, you know that building was placed up within 10 feet of that sidewalk there. Uh, in front of that house, you can see it would, I think it would stand out. It would block the view of all those houses going down the street. There's another copy of the site plan. Those. Well, the shrubs within the buffer here, uh, I think they're like two or three foot high up against a three foot fence. So no matter where you're at on this intersection, uh, you're gonna be able to see the building, whether it be walking down Cottage Grove or if you're walking on 35th, since all the parking is on the south side of the lot there, you're gonna be able to look right down the drive and see the outdoor seating. Um, you know, since this is the only MX1 site, the only use of this nature uh, for several blocks, you know, I think that in itself promotes walkability. It's not going to be where the building is with on the lot. You know, if somebody wants to walk to this from three or four blocks away, the decision to do so isn't going to be where the building is. It's going to be the service and the goods that they provide, and that will decide whether or not they return. Just a couple of the, uh, I'm going to address a couple of the comments that may have come up earlier. The, uh, I thought it was a two story, now it's a one story building, um, 16 foot high. It's going to be shorter than the building that was there previously. Um, you know, traffic, anytime you, you know, any use like this that hasn't been incorporated in the neighborhood is obviously going to increase traffic, but it's meant to provide walkability. I think we've done that with the outdoor seating, uh, the high visibility off both streets. Um, the lot provides the required amount of parking. Um, trash is normally in the back side of the building hidden from uh, view along the streets as we've shown it. Um, future use and the owner wants to wants this to be a long time thing that his family and you know kids can continue to operate so it's always hard to predict what the future might be. Uh, the alley we thought that was a good buffer for the residents. Um, I think improving that and incorporating that into a new parking lot would put too much traffic on there. Um, so if we did have a, if the building was to the east and we had a single lot, or a lot with a single entrance, I and mean, it's only five or six cars, there's a good chance someone would pull in there, the lot would be full. There's not a lot of maneuvering space when the lot's full, so they'd try to back up on a cottage grove. So we think this one way access through the existing parking lot that's been there since 2007 provides the safest um, traffic flow through the property. With that I ask any, answer any questions you might have. Question. Um, if the parking lot was to be shifted, what would the traffic flow then look like? Would it mainly be the alleyway being an entry point and then a second one off on cottage? Or well, essentially be, two entries off of cottage, the well, alleyway? It would be too small to have two entrances off of cottage. Um, it would either be one entrance off of cottage or improving the alley, which I indicated I think right now. Leaving it now, there's going to be less traffic. Is a, a better, a good buffer from the residents behind it. So it'd probably be a small lot with three stalls on each side. So when you pull in, somebody might come down the street and pull in quick. Oh, it's full. Now what do I do? I can't turn around. I got to back up. Any other questions? If you were to move it from the west to the east and not be using the parking lot, what is the cost differential for that uh, layout? I, I don't know, the owner said probably about 60000 for the part, new parking lot, which I'm sure you'd rather put into the building. 60000 Yeah. What's the total project cost? I, Yeah, 
350,000. Got it, okay. Um, for the house to the south, what is the distance between the porch and the sidewalk? You're saying that we'd be blocking that view, but I guess if we're moving over to the far east of it, and you're saying we need to, you know, with the city's distance they're acquiring, will you actually be blocking that view or will you just be aligned with the porch? Is the house directly south of it? So if you're uh, talking about the requirements that, the city's that's probably, wanting. It's probably 20 feet. But it's the closest one. As you go, as you go farther south, they're, they get much, much farther off the city. So if you're aligned with the porch, we'd get rid of the issue of the view problem and also be in line with what the city is looking for, right? I, I don't know if aligning with the porch would be close enough. That house sits back farther than 10 feet. Okay, and last one. So regarding sustainability, I mean, obviously this is a third ice cream shop in 16 blocks, right? On this street alone. So I'm curious if, if we're thinking that maybe we can't sustain three ice cream shops in 16 blocks, is there an actual business case for it being more sustainable, that building's more reusable on the west and the east? Well, they will serve you know, sandwiches, breakfast. It's going to be more than just ice cream shop. And that was, when we started this a couple years ago, we were thinking about putting a, uh, you know, ice cream truck or a trailer on the lot. Then it's evolved into this where you will serve more than just ice cream. So it's more like a... Uh, you know, cafe or a you know, small restaurant. So the size of it the, is sustainable as a business, as a restaurant on this site, and it makes more sense to be on the west and the east for, for a business sustainability perspective? Yes. Okay. I have a quick question. So aside from the desire to maintain the existing parking lot, is there, in terms of like other challenges to moving the building, um, there don't appear to be any topography challenges. It looks pretty flat. Are there any utility challenges, or is the parking lot kind of the sole uh, reason? It's part of the parking lot, and the fact that the building was there for 84 of the last 92 years. Why not, you know, put one back where it was? It's going to be nice in the middle. It's there, provide a great neighborhood service, amenity. Um, there's no utility cha challenges. The water's in Cottage Grove and the sanitary sewers in 35th. But, you know, like I said, why, why tear something up and cause an expense and send stuff that will landfill if you don't have to? Thanks. Are there any other similar setups in the area? Uh, I'm sure there are some up on University. I don't you know, the library is just up the... Yeah, the library is the exact same configuration, two blocks away. Yeah, it's up on University. Yeah, and their building sits, yeah, it is just like ours. It sits back away. And if there were other MX1 uses along this block and they were all, you know, up in line, I could certainly see the point of moving this up. But since it's just so isolated, you know, the use in itself is going to provide walkability and encourage people to go to the site. There should be on a corner a lot, but we front uh, you know, Cottage Grove. I'm sure there's a lot of people walking along Cottage Grove with all the residents. All right, if there are no other questions, thank you. Is there anyone in the audience who wishes to speak in favor of this item? Okay. Anyone opposed? Please come up, you have five minutes, state your name, address, and sign in when you're done. Uh, Jim Stork, uh, 1073 35th Street, basically across the street. Um, I, okay, it's an ice cream shop. Uh, there's going to only be four parking spaces and one handicapped. Uh, you've been by Snookies in the spring. It's just packed people waiting out on Beaver. And I'm expecting the same thing here. Uh, the library is a block away, library cafe, block away. 
uh, I don't know how many times I've called. I love the library, but I don't know how many times I've called the police to say, okay, take of these cars that are just parked along here illegally uh, at peak times. Um, third, what happens when this doesn't make it? Is this going to turn into a bar? I don't know. So uh, I'm just saying I'm worried about the traffic. I'm worried about turning it into a bar. And uh, that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else in the audience who wishes to speak in opposition? Carol? Hi, my name is Carol Maher. I live in Ward 3, zip code 50312. Um, for when you talk about walkability, that means you don't feature parking. And the way this is cited on the lot is that you're featuring the parking. So that's why the parking should be in the back. And if you build parking, they will use it. So I'd strongly recommend that you add more bike parking spots. I think there's maybe a couple of racks thrown in there. And if you want to encourage people to come, you don't show them where to park right up front. You show them that you're, you like bicyclists and you like them to spend their, your money there. Um, and you encourage them, the neighbors, to walk. Um, also, um, the house that's just south has sort of annexed this parking lot into their unit. They're the same owner. So um, it's kind of used as a personal parking lot, it appears. So it's not, it's, it's not quite exactly a parking lot today. It's being used by the owner for personal parking or sold for per, as personal parking. And really, this is Des Moines, and we should think er, like a city. We are an, an urban center, and this is a place where people walk, and there's lots of going to be a lots of students around there. I'm pleased to hear it. Sounds like it's going to be a year-round organization, year-round business. That means that the sidewalks will get shoveled year-round versus just versus not. Um, if it's not open year-round, they may not do their duty on shoveling. So um, I think moving it up into an urban look and feel, moving the parking to the back is really the right way to go. Thank you. Thanks, Carol. Is there anyone else in opposition to this item or neutral? Seeing none, the applicant has five minutes for rebuttal or to answer questions. And just please state your name and address since you didn't speak before. Uh, my name is Abdul Hakim Saleh. My address is 1080 35th Street. I am opening the ice cream shop, which is the name of it, is a sweet lounge. And we're going to be serving breakfast all day. And there's going to be dessert. And there's going to be a lot of good drinks and popsicles and good things for kids and families around my neighborhood. Uh, we are not like the bar down the street from us. We're not serving alcohol. And we, like the, the, on the other person said, we live in the neighborhood. And we, we've been looking for this for over 40 years. And we saw all the potential about it. You know, it's a good place, good place, good location. And since we bought the property, we've been maintaining it from the A to the Z. All my neighborhood loved it. They loved the way, like, we took over and we made a beautiful corner for all my neighborhood without putting anything into it. And all we put in so far is just money, but we're okay with it to make our neighbors happy. So for saying, like, I'm using it as a per personal parking lot, I do have two kids and they grow and they gain cars, you know, which is I'm using it temporary. As soon as my business is established, we're going to put a garage in the back of our house. That way we don't have to use the parking lot. Uh, for the traffic... I know we don't have enough space for a parking lot, but we have a lot of street around us. They have a side parking street, which is 36, and even Cudge Grove, even Kingman, you know, which is a lot of my neighbor. They would just feel free to walk. We're not too far. 
and we're not like in the corner of a bad traffic street like Snooky's. Snooky is in, in a really cool, tough intersections, which is I live too, not too far from it, and I see how the traffic gets there in the summertime. But our goal is a lot of our customers will be our neighbors, or the guy down five blocks down, able to walk to entertain, and we're not looking to upset the neighbors or to make somebody don't like our business. And, and I'm building this one for my wife and my daughters and my son, and we're looking to continue to grandkids, grand grandkids. We're not looking to, to let it go. And also, the reason I want to put the building in the back, I think it would be best for, because if you put it in the front also, it will kind of block the corner of the 35th Street when people are coming out to turn it right or left in the 35th, which is you're coming from Kaji Grove, and when you're coming to the intersection of 35th, which is this is two-stop sign, the one on the east and one in the west. And then I used to have a huge bush in the corner of the left. I used to have a huge bush in the corner of the property, and then I removed it because within one year, we had three accidents in that corner because the bush was about just eight foot tall, and with a lot of accident involved about it. So I moved it because I felt like maybe it will kind of open up for the neighbor. And since then, there's been less accident. People are able to see it, to view better. And it's now if we put the building there, it will kind of block the view. And then also, like, we don't have the problem to put it in the front if you guys want us to do it. You know, we go ahead to tear the concrete. It just, we just try to kind of save as much as we can to start a business. We are local. We're not from out of town. We're not big company or big investor. You know, I came to America 21 years ago. I had $25 in my pocket, and I'm trying to be, you know, open something for me and my family for the future. Thank you. Thank you very much. Do we have any questions from the commissioners? I, I do. I was hoping Michael could come up and address the question from the gentleman about the bar. Sure, it's currently zoned MX1, which wouldn't allow for the bar use. Um, it would allow for a restaurant use. Um, there would be a need to get a liquor license. Um, and the maximum amount of alcohol they could sell there in a restaurant type would be 50%. Um, they'd have to have 50% of gross receipts be uh, food or preparation of food. Thank you for that clarification. Any other questions? All right. Yeah. I'm, oh. yeah. <clears throat> I think this one's for staff. Uh, what was the reasoning behind the reasoning for the parking lot being shift? I don't, yeah. Sure, I, I can go ahead and cover that, Michael. Um, just going back to some of, you know, just I'm going to try to kind of summarize some points that have been hit on. Um, you know, Drake neighborhood is a traditional walkable neighborhood. There's examples of other corner stores in the area. Um, uh, I think 28th and Kingman is an example off the top of my head. Um, and we just felt that it made more sense to put the building out front to fit into this traditional character that you see around it uh, than at the back, which putting parking in the front is more of a suburban solution. Um, and that's been mentioned tonight as well. Our design guidelines for storefront buildings anticipated that. So as we developed our code and we developed design standards, um, that's what, you know, why that the relief is needed. Um, you know, because as we developed uh, how we want the city to develop over time, redevelop is as, you know, not everything that exists today conforms. Um, but things redevelop, and as that happens, uh, uh, the, the thought behind Chapter 135 was to work at an area such as this to that more uh, urban format. So uh, I don't know if that helps answer the question. or if you would, oops. Yeah, no, just really quickly. So if we talk about tradition, I mean, it's been there 84 out of the 92 years. The houses there have been as long. Is there... So I don't know why we're trying, I don't know if, why we're trying to change that. It's, 
it was designed, so we're questioning how it was designed earlier. Is it possible to leave it there, but even move it closer up front, or is there some way we can do this without tearing up all that concrete sure. and throwing it back into our rivers and all of that stuff? If, can we find a solution? Yeah, I mean, I, I well, I think this the ultimately those are the kinds of things the commission has to to weigh out, and so and and we thought about that as staff. Um, yeah. There has been a building. I mean, this isn't historic preservation in the sense that we're trying to respect the specific development pattern of this lot and any new building should be where the old ones were. It's about looking at just kind of a broader de development pattern and and that the urban nature of it and trying as we have new development. That's the perspective we took as staff. And I, I don't have any, you know, if the commission feels that, um, you know, the reusing the, the pavement is more important. That's fine, it's your decision to make, but as staff and balancing it all out, we ultimately said, you know, that um, things are gonna redevelop, things that exist today don't always conform. Um, we'll, we'll stick with our recommendation of keeping it um, within the standards of the code. I will say that we would, if there was a need to offer some level of setback relief, we'd be supportive of that. But just putting the building all the way at the back, I mean, I, I think the outdoor patio deck space is a wonderful idea. And I would expect that that would be in front of this building on the side street. So the building really wouldn't be at zero. The building would be at, you know, 10 feet. I, I think the drawings show that is about 11 or 12. A couple of feet, ex, you know, you know, that could be administratively reviewed with the type one if it was needed to be 12 feet. Um, and, and that would still also put the outdoor seating area on the east side of the building. So afternoon sun, you know, the building's blocking the sun, which matches what they've done. So those are, those are the thought processes we went through. But again, ultimately, just to close my comments, this is your guys' decision to make. This is just our recommendation. Um, I, I would tend to support the applicant site plan here. Um, understanding the argument about redevelopment and but I think it's compelling that this is the only MX1 place in this neighborhood and this corner is really open I think that having the building all the way on the east side is going to feel very strange on this intersection um, and I think that the traffic flow that exists on that site plan already works quite well coming in off Cottage Grove and exiting onto 35th. So, um, you know, I kind of understand the letter of the ordinance, but I think in this case, the site plan that they've developed really makes the most sense. Procedurally, I'm just making sure. So right now we're asking questions of staff because we're still open. Is that right? Before we close and deliberate, is that? Right. Because I have one staff question. Yeah, you can still ask it a question. Okay. So as far as the, the staff question, so if this, if this building had still been here and we're rehabilitating that building versus it being now green, would staff look at this differently? Is it just because it is a new it, development is why we want to make sure it conforms versus... If they just waited and left some studs, we'd be fine with where it was. But it actually, if it was an existing building, the code has existing. They'd have existing building rights. We wouldn't even be here. I mean, do you know? Do you know what I'm getting at? So it wouldn't even be a question. It, they would be allowed to renovate the building, and and make their whatever site improvements they needed. They yeah. Have, so just because just because it got torn down first before right. now now we're sitting here, it's torn down. Yeah. We're trying to rebuild. That's why we're here. Yeah, and, and that might seem maybe punitive in this particular case because it's a small lot, but that's, I mean, if you think about all the stuff that we review, uh, mm -hmm. that you see, that we, we see even more of, redevelopment is what happens in Des Moines. We don't have, we have very little greenfield development. So the notion of a building coming down and then the site being redeveloped is, um, that's normal. That's a normal everyday occurrence um, from our perspective. Nope. All right, I will close the public hearing so that we can um, entertain a motion. It sounds like some people might have a motion ready. I just wanted to, on one perspective, I, I, 
agree so fully in some ways, and, and actually, ironically, I'm actually more in favor of moving the building to the east in this case. If someone who's in that area, it makes a lot of sense to me. This has already come down. 17% cost differential is actually less than what we would actually force on someone on a utility burying. However, at the same time, I do think that there is there can be significant traffic impacts and parking impacts. So not to make this motion, but to throw it out there, I would be of the mind of saying I would move staff on this if traffic can come back and demonstrate that there will not be any adverse traffic or parking impacts on this site. Because I'm not entirely sure that's possible. If we're able to keep the same, tra if we're able to keep the same traffic safety and able to keep the same parking accessibility, 17% doesn't seem to bother me as much. And I, I sort of think that corner having the building as we are wanting it going forward doesn't seem to be negative. But that's my own personal opinion on that one. So I'm not making a motion yet, but that would be the way I would, I would love to have us think about it. Is if it isn't going to impact anything, fine, but I think I agree with this pattern. It would be hard for me to see how this moving it to the right isn't a safety issue. Or to the east, I'm sorry. Yes, I, I believe that moving it to the east could become a safety or parking access issue. Can they put the recommendations on the screen? Yeah, we'll, we'll flip Thank to you. that slide. In short, in short, staff was recommending an approval of the, um, the frontage, uh, the reduction in the required amount of frontage, and then denial of the setback request. You'll have to forgive us. Running the, the mouse from Clue over there is a little bit clunky. Yeah, what the staff recommendation is, is yes, approve the request to not have whatever the, um, the, the frontage along Cottage, but, but move it to the east so it would be within 10 feet of the east property line. There we go. We got there. I think I would support what Chris said. I, I feel like we have an opportunity to maybe do better in terms of you know, new development. We don't have the opportunity to build a new building every day, so let's get that right versus parking lot. I understand the sustainability component, but the, the building can also be sustainable and might be there longer anyways. It has a longer life, potentially. So I would propose um, moving staff, but then, uh, you know, with the caveat that I think the traffic part needs to be studied and, and proven out. I don't know if the applicant has been able to do that yet or not, but um, that could be the challenge there. So I would support what Chris said. Thank you. There's a motion on the floor. I do have a quick question. That It would have to go through traffic. Any, doesn't everything have to go through traffic when we're doing yeah, it? Yeah, I mean, any site plan is getting reviewed through by our traffic and transportation division staff. I think maybe the point that you're making is the the drawing that they've reacted to is the drawing that's in front of you because that's what the applicants provided to date. So I think that's a fair observation. And if um, if you did act on that, they would have the ability, you know, should we, you know, get further into it to apply to come back to you guys with, a, you know, a second request with new information. Okay. So is is the, so the motion then I guess is moving staff conditional on traffic demonstrating that the movement that complying with staff will not have a negative safety or a negative parking access impact. Is that fair? Okay, well. Sure. <laughs> oh, yeah. um, uh, you can include that in there, but the, the reality is, is that if they can, um, it might, it's a little bit un unnecessary because it's kind of, they, if they, if they, Submit something that complies with the setback, and traffic and transportation approves it. Then it's all you know. It's assumed you know. Then that's all through that process that's taking place. So I'm I'm talking what I'm thinking. So I, I don't think there's any harm in including that language in in the in the motion. 
because I mean it's kind of understood. But if you want, if that's better, go ahead and. Well, I guess that the, so. Here's I guess here's where I'm where I'm going with that. So let's make sure my intent is not misunderstood, so that people don't. So what what I'm saying is right now we have a parking setup that makes sense if we have you know people coming in off of Cottage and out off of 35th. That makes sense. There's a safety benefit to that, right? There's also safety benefit theoretically if you know depending on what we think. The traffic here is. I, I understand the concern with respect to Snookies, but Snookies is very unique, and this is a very quiet set of streets as well, with a lot of street parking. If you can't find street parking around here, probably shouldn't be driving. There's a, there's a site issue, right? So I think that there is. There, but there are, you know, right now we will have a traffic flow impact of this configuration of this in and out situation, and we'll have a number of spaces on this site that can be safely put onto that site. That should be our baseline. If we can say, hey, I'll shift it over here, I can now come back with a configuration that is equal or as, is as safe or safer, sweet. But I guess I'm, I have a hard time believing that's possible, given I mean, it, it seems like they need a lot of work here to actually ensure that we'll have the same level of safety with two well, ins and outs on the same street. Yeah. I mean, right? I, that's going to be a little bit of a, a I don't know that our transportation division is going to get into that level. I mean, they're going to look at driveway placement. They're going to. This isn't a uh, use that generate that has enough traffic that'll generate a parking study need. Um, you know, from a parking analysis, uh, you know, our code actually, um, you know, you can count on street parking. Um, so, you know, they may end up with a, a little bit less parking spaces, but that'd be something that, unless it's substantially less, you know, like you know, staff would probably, it would be within a type one range. We'd work with them with that. I, I, I sense that you, you kind of, what you're, maybe I'm misreading this, but I sense that what you really would like to do is continue this and have them explore the stuff, the, all this, and then come back. Because I, I feel like maybe you don't want to just leave it up to staff, which is fine, but I just wonder if the better avenue for you is to continue it, if that's truly what you're looking for, is to have this report back because if you if you go with the motion we're going to work with them and we'll probably get uh, to a place that staff is comfortable with and we'll approve it yeah so i guess yeah maybe there's confusion i don't want to get to a point where staff basically says yep it's on the east and yep we've just not done enough of a study to know if there's any impacts so, of eh, this is good enough so then yep you're forced to go to the east we're forcing them to go to the east and force them to change the configuration right. of this parking lot, the configuration of the traffic flow that will occur on this corner that we have right now, we know has a certain baseline safety level. And so, yes, I would like to make sure that we are, if we pass Our, our, our traffic transportation division is going to look at it the same way they already have, which is it doesn't require a traffic study. They're going to look at how close is, are the driveways to the intersection, and and you know uh, is there adequate space you know for maneuvering and you know they'll look at some rudimentary stuff but there's not going to be like no matter where the building is on the site we're just making assumption based assumptions based off of our perception that this is safe I mean you know what I mean there's not a traffic study today to tell us what we think we're seeing so that level of scrutiny is not going to be the level of scrutiny that we've been afforded today is not going to be different down the road if, with a different configuration. That may, yeah, that makes sense. So you're saying if we pass this motion, it won't actually do what we're intending, which is what we're intending is saying, prove that it is not going to be negatively impacting moves to the east. We're saying now nah, we'll come. We're just going to say it's fine enough. It's so it's good. Let's go to the east. And now we're going to be adding that cost. We're going to be reducing the number of parking spaces. We're going to be reducing the number of reasonable ins and out, safe ins and safe ins and outs. Then, is that? It, what I'm saying is from a, that. I, I you've just to be to the point. This doesn't. This is doesn't love, rise to the level of warranting a traffic study from the city's processes. Our engineering staff would look at the new configuration and based off of their professional expertise and and our standards for like how far driveways have to be apart and those things would make some some interpretation decisions but there's not going to be uh, like a traffic study in the sense that I think you're hoping that will come and prove that it's equally as safe but we don't 
we're making an assumption today. We don't have a traffic study today to tell us that this is, how safe is this? We, we don't know. We're just assuming because we sense that maybe it, it is. Well then, in, yeah, and I, I've seen a lot of those traffic studies now, so I guess I would retract my motion and say that no, I, I do not want to go to the east if, if we aren't going to do the work to figure out if that's suitable. So yeah, I, I guess, I'm sorry, I, I want to pull my motion then. So no, no, you don't have a motion, Kayla does. Oh, so. sorry, sorry, uh, yeah. one second. So I would like to pull hers, can we do that? <laughs> that's a friendly amendment, yes. I would, so I would, we're looking to continue the item so we can see their revision if it works. as. Is that what I'm understanding? I think that I don't know if that's been actually oh. proposed as an amendment. I would like to add a, a comment from the safety side. If, if that's what we're considering here, um, how would it impact safety to remove what's currently there and shift the building to the east side? I think the fact that moving the building and following staff, um, um, the staff recommendation will remove a driveway. So that by itself c helps with the safety of that intersection. Uh, having one driveway in from Cottage Road and then using the alley, that right there should satisfy the safety piece. In addition, I think what Jason is getting to is that traffic and transportation will conduct the review that is within their purview, which includes that um, safety piece as well. It will not trigger the traffic study, but it, it does include a safety piece. That's where the whole driveway conversation comes in. That's why I'm sure this site will not be able to have two entrances from Cottage Road, and I think that will be um, a major impact to the safety of this intersection as a whole, not only for the traffic, but also for the pedestrians and the bicyclists that will be um, frequenting this site. So I will approve, I, I want to approve, I will support the uh, the motion that's in place, um, but I just wanted to throw that out there for discussion or consideration. What's the motion in place again? The motion is from Kayla and it is to move staff with some language about, you know, traffic. Uh, yeah, I would, yeah, I don't really know how to word that, but coordination with city staff um, on the parking lot as it's on the west side, you know, the curb cuts, et cetera, just to make sure that it complies. But it seems like that's part of the process anyway, so probably unnecessary. So we're <clears throat> moving, moving staff. Moving staff for them to review the building staying as is with yeah, what happened. She's, uh, if I could, I, I think where I heard you last is you're just moving the staff rec. And, and which is the the building doesn't need to be wider as it occupies Cottage Grove, but it does need to be slid over, and so it's within 10 feet, roughly, of the east property line along 35th Street. Can you show me that on the map, please? Yeah, it's, if we can go back to the... Go to the site plan and leave it at the site plan. So the building is just going to slide over uh, so it would be in the corner. So I, yeah. Right. Does that make Does that help? All right. We have a motion on the floor from Kayla. Move staff. All in favor, please raise your right hand. All opposed, please raise your right hand. And I think we need an affirmative motion, don't we? Or what? Uh, I'm sorry, I was still, you guys moved so fast. I think, did I have four for, so I had Francis, Johnny, Emily, for the, in support of the motion, who was in favor? Johnny, Emily, Kayla and Francis. Kayla and Francis. So the, okay, yeah. So the motion fell. It's four to six. So we need enough to move forward. I believe we need an affirmative motion. Correct? Is that? Yeah, you would need somebody to make the, a, a, a new motion. A new motion. It could be. It doesn't have. I mean, it could be approval as proposed. It could be something in the middle. You know, whatever you want. <coughs> a new motion. A motion. 
I'm not making a motion, but a motion to approval as as is is what the applicant is asking for. Correct. I would like to make that motion. Okay. Okay. So it's, yeah, approval of the request as proposed. Okay. All in favor, please raise your right hand. Thanks, Francis. <laughs> and all opposed, please raise your right hand. Appreciate everyone motion here. Motion carries seven zero or seven three. Excuse me. All right. I uh, just J Johnny, Emily, and Kayla on the. Okay. All right. We are going to move on to item number six: a request from Jonathan Palmer for review and approval of a public hearing site plan for property at four one two five East Thirtieth, and for Type Two Design Alternative to allow a driveway expansion that exceeds the maximum allowed front yard area. Um, Shiroshi will be presenting this item. Thank you, Madam Chair, Shiroshi Chakraborty, uh, planning staff. Um, item number six is a um, public hearing site plan uh, for a residential property. A, the applicant um, yeah, is proposing to um, to add a driveway, um, additional second driveway onto his property in order to construct a circle driveway. Um, as a result of this um, proposed driveway expansion, um, the uh, total impervious area for the front yard is uh, exceeding the, the required amount, which is 25% of the uh, front yard, so it puts it to about 54%, which um, exceeds the uh, maximum allowed front yard impervious area. Um, the property is um, on 4125 East 30th Street. Um, here's an, an aerial, um, shows you um, uh, the property is in a residential area, N1B neighborhood district, and there is residential um, zoning and uses adjacent to the to the subject property so it's in the douglas acres neighborhood and um here's some photographs which um i'll try to explain uh what's going on here so um this uh driveway approach that you see is the existing drive driveway um, the applicant is, has applied for a right-of-way permit to add a second driveway, which is going to be here. And then the, the two driveways are going to be joined, uh, forming a circle driveway, uh, which, is, which is essentially uh, why the impervious um, uh, area is exceeding the allowed uh, 25%. A few more photographs of the, of the neighborhood. Um, I have a um, sketch that I can show if you have uh, questions later, but um, I, will, I will basically try to explain uh, staff's uh, rationale and uh, what is being uh, recommended here. So uh, with the addition of the uh, second driveway and the circle driveway, what would happen is that it would add approximately 1,114 square feet of paving to the front yard, which will bring the impervious surface area to about 54%. Um, since the property is zoned N1B and it has over 100 uh, feet of frontage, um, a circle driveway is allowed. However, um, because it's 54%, uh, staff feels that this is um, excessive. The applicant can modify the design, um, and with that, uh, staff believes that that uh, with the modification of the of the design, they can put about 650 square feet of paving, which would bring the impervious area to about 38%. So that will still be above the 25%. Uh, however, it is below um, 40%, which is typically, historically, what staff has been comfortable supporting if it exceeds the minimum 25%. So by making that modification, um, that would bring the uh, impervious area to 38%. And I'll um, go back to the aerial so I can explain how staff is proposing that modification be made. So 
Um, currently, if you, if you look at the aerial, um, the, the driveway approaches are about um, uh, 14 feet and 18 feet um, in width, and they circle around. Um, staff thinks that uh, 14 to 18 feet um, width of the driveway circling around is uh, probably not necessary. The applicant could narrow it down to about 10 feet in width. And if the width of the driveway is uh, narrowed down to 10 feet, that is what would bring the uh, 1,114 square feet of uh, paving down to about 650 square feet, uh, which would bring the impervious area down to about 38%. So um, staff is recommending uh, denial of the type two design alternative re request. However, staff would be supportive if the applicant would, um, um, would consider mod modification to the design to reduce the width of the driveway to 10, 10 feet, which would allow um, the front yard uh, impervious surface to be around 38%. So staff is recommending that uh, the, um, the type two design alternative be denied and that with that condition that the new drive approach and the circle driveway be modified to 10 feet wide, which would add up to 650 square feet of additional paving in the front yard, which is about 38% of the front yard. Shreyoshi, I think uh, Bert has the site plan pulled up. I think it maybe got dropped out of the presentation. Yep. I think it, that the applicant submitted, I just want to we can go to the document camera. Just uh, I think it helps illustrate yep. the proposal. Slide it up a little bit there, Bert. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Bert. So um, as I was mentioning, you can see here the um, the width the width of the um, the driveway here is fourteen feet. Uh, this is the existing driveway, but over here where we have the circle drive, it's about 18 feet wide. So if the applicant were to consider narrowing that down to about 10 feet, that is what would bring, the, um, bring it down to 38% impervious surface rather than the 54% that we see with his proposed, with the applicant's proposed design. Um, Staff believes that the 10 feet is uh, probably sufficient for parking as well as getting in and out of the vehicle, and therefore um, and that's, that's the reason that uh, 10 feet is being uh, recommended. And, so, I, and just to clarify, that's 10 feet for the, the L, that's the circle, the 14 and the 18, it's not, that calculation does not, is not addressing the primary drive approach which the drawing shows is 18 feet, generally speaking. So it's really about that circle and the additional kind of loop through. Yeah, it's, it's just this. <clears throat> if you have any questions, I'd be happy to take them. If the, app, if the applicant was proposing permeable pavers or permeable concrete, would this same, uh, how would you approach that? So if they came through and said, hey, we're going to use permeable pavers here, how would you consider this then? I, I believe that the 25% also includes uh, semi-permeable uh, um, surfaces. And Jason, you can correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah, but I can. Um, there is for the, the, the front yard areas where you get the 25%, but for the total site, there is an allowance of above and beyond. I'll have to look for semi-permeable pavement, but I, don't, I think you're right. I don't know that that applies to the front yard. I'll, I can double check as the presentation's made. Yeah, I'm, just, I'm curious, is, is, is the intent of the, I'm curious about the intent of the ordinance in this case, and so since we do know there's a difference in front yard versus overall, it's probably not just primarily uh, water runoff, so there must be something else at play. And I guess I'm wondering if there is something else at play. Is there a requirement to the number of cars that can be parked in a front yard in this neighborhood? And if we are basically building out a circle driveway here, is it really actually going to be more of a parkway versus a driveway here? I mean, is it probably likely just going to be holding a lot more cars in front? Because there is already a garage, there is a lot of driveway. I'm, I'm curious what the intent of the driveway is and versus the ordinance of what we're looking to uh, avoid. Sure. Well, uh, 
I mean, the intent of how it gets used, we'll have to ask the applicant, but uh, the, I mean, there's a couple of different things. There is the stormwater runoff and having, you know, and I think that's important, but it's also a character perspective of not having, you know, having some limitations on how much pavement you can do in the front yard. And even our old zoning code had that 25% limit. So it's, it's a long standing standard in Des Moines that, you know, we're, we're um, we, you know, you don't want your, we don't want folks to have their entire front yard paved. Um, so I think it's a, it's a little bit of an urban design and um, impact on the character of the neighborhood and then that impacts your neighbors. So it's not just, you know, it's, it's also thinking about your neighbors from that and then also stormwater management just across the city and having a green area that water can absorb into. I have a question for Siriyoshi. Um There appears to be a curb cut there for that um, southern side of the of the property has that always been there or was that added as part of their current gravel there pathway? is there is an existing um, uh, it, it's a gravel uh, driveway but it's being used as a gravel driveway essentially and the applicant applied for a um, driveway permit for that particular so, um, yeah. Curb cut to the south. If, if I, I'm, I, I have um, just a little information to add because I had talked to Kyle, uh, one of our other staffers, about this. I apologize. Um, there is no there that that was added within the last. You know that that curb has been cut down in the last few years. They're now trying to you know to actually put pavement there. That's where they've come in and to get the. the permit to actually do it if you if you go back to Google Street View I, I don't know how long the applicant has owned the place but there's been some modifications and that driveway was at least from what I saw in the Google Street View has been added in the last few years um, I don't does that help answer the question there clarify the history of the two curb cuts the one in front of the garage I think has been there for some time All right, thanks, Roshi. Is the applicant present? Please come forward. You have 10 minutes. State your name, address, and sign in when you're done. Good evening. Johnny Palmer, 4125 East 30th Street. Uh, it's a new experience for me, so I hope we can all enjoy this together. I've already enjoyed the first part. That was thrilling about the ice cream stop. Uh, um, well, yes, let me answer some of these questions. Um, I've lived here since 2015 when I bought the house. It was basically a dilapidated, rundown, previous occupant, died in this home. Uh, I have, I've, the oldest picture is actually one I've actually made progress on. So it doesn't really demonstrate all the changes. And I wish you could see that. From this, I mean, I've already spent two years working on it. Um, originally, the grading was so high in the front yard, um, it actually almost was like a dirt curb. It had bushes all the way. Um, I actually found where he was watering those in the, the, ah, the hose, permeable hose or whatever he was using was six inches deep. So I had to get all that cleared out just so it wouldn't keep pushing water back. I was having foundation issues. There was one side, I, it was pushed in, the crack was that big. I've done quite a bit of work to get this thing back to its condition. Um, as you can see from one of the current photos, um, I've completely recited this, re-roofed this. Um, the garage, I pushed back. It was previously where that truck is. Um, and as I've been doing this, I've waited on the driveway. Um, when we were using the skid loader, I think that's where some of the damage came to that area, but that also inspired a driveway. Um, part of the reason I want that there is because I have a truck and trailer. I'm a finished carpenter, so I regularly am moving this truck and trailer, whether I'm coming home from work or leaving in the morning. I park it sometimes behind the basketball hoop. You can't see it, but it's... Yeah, on the side over by the truck. Um, and I, I chose that size, the 18 feet coming out, 
because it gives me plenty of room with a truck and trailer. Um, I understand staff has proposed 10 feet. Um, I think that's just a little too narrow. I understand the concerns about water. Um, I watch the water regularly because in my patio area, which I just do this, this patio area here between the house and the garage is all concrete. And that it allows, I've got drainage running out, tiling all the way out into the backyard to disperse that. Um, so I've done everything I can to get that water to go back into the big yard. That's one of the problems with this Douglas area and one of the wonderful things about it. You can see I've got tons of room in the back. But all these houses, most of them, are pushed so far forward, especially mine, I don't have much room. Um, we're, not, we're not big car people. Um, it's not like it's going to become a parking lot. But when we do want to park or when guests come over, uh, my side, the east side, is a no parking zone. Right in front of me is three mailboxes. Now we can park there. Most of the time the mailman's not there, but under circumstances at times we cross paths. And I don't want to make it any more inconvenient for him. Plus the benefit of us being able to get in and out easily is something we look forward to. Um, I proposed, I, I think it was Kyle, just in our email correspondence, that I would come down to a, instead of 18 feet, I even said 12 and a half feet, which would give me enough room, I believe, for a truck and trailer to get through there and around the half circle with a little to, well, little problem, I guess. But um, other than that, that's kind of what I'm looking for. Is the truck and trailer used for turning it around to back it into the driveway, or is it to actually pull in and park the truck and trailer there? I don't really intend to leave it there in the front yard. I have a security camera system, um, so I actually like to, when I'm not using it, most, I'd say 70% of the time it's on a job site. I come into work in West Des Moines on houses that will be there for sometimes six months, um, sometimes three months, sometimes I'm just doing daily jobs. but as it comes and goes, the trailer might be parked behind the basketball court, or not court, but behind the basketball hoop. Um, sometimes it's actually in the driveway right in front of the truck. Um, I use my garage sometimes as a shop. Um, but it's more that I can have that ease to get in there. It means I'm not backing up doing three-point turns on the street. Um, I've noticed since I've lived there, we have a few of those people that like to get off 29th and race down 30th. Um, so I try to be quick about it. I've, you know, I have wonderful neighbors. There's only one or two that I find uh, have less respect for the law when it comes to speeding, which I'll be honest, I have a trouble with when I'm on the highway, but we're working on that. Um, my point is, I think it would be easier just all said and done for me to just make it easy. Also, my wife, I enjoy being able to have her car so she can park right up there next to the gate. I think there's a picture we showed earlier um, where she parks right up there in the front, which I have this one that kind of was, you know, a quick sketch, you know, phone thing, just to kind of show that. But she'll park there. She also likes parking under the shade of the tree behind the basketball court, you know, to keep her car cool. But it's all pretty standard, you know, trying to be efficient and and effective for what we have in this neighborhood. And since my house is so far forward, I am limited on options. And I don't, you know, I don't want my truck and trailer to become a hazard. So it sounds like you would agree to anything above the 12 and a half? Anything above? Like, I go bigger? <laughs> or anything between 18 and 12 and a half? Well, I. <laughs> I think 18 might be a big stream. Seeing on the picture I drew, I mean, you, you saw my wonderful art. You know, um, I I measured it out, but I measured it out for plenty of room. Um, I still want to put a tree there, you know, in that center section. You know, I still want to put a tree there eventually. You know, once we get this finished up, I'm I'm pretty close. I mean, this house is almost done. 
uh, you can probably see from my permits I'm finishing up the kitchen and bathroom and so in the next hopefully three months I'll be 100% done with this house and then we can sit back and enjoy the fruits of our labor and you know not have that evening night weekend work going on so yeah I think if we I mean I propose 12 and a half because 10 seems a little small I do a lot of uh, houses that you know as they do their driveways oh man I've I don't know how many times I've heard of them running off their little thin driveway and tearing up their grass killing sprinkler heads um, you know I I think even from a professional view, I think 10 is just a little small, but I understand our percentage issue. Um, so I, I think if we can just get a little more like 12 and a half, 13 sounds great, but you know, I also will accept, you know, what's, you know, what's best. I am just curious because I'm with some of these like the step two is always okay we got this thing in here we intended to do it one way and now we're using it differently I know that we've had instances of come forward where we've had enforcement actions on essentially work trailers in in front of a house is that something the staff has identified as a potential problem here knowing that the use is for parking a work trailer even if it's from time to time now, I, I don't want us to prove something that all of a sudden we're like oh man well, now you can't do what you want to do. Like, yeah, I, I think our perspective is we recognize in, in his um, uh, in this particular house type and zoning, and um, given his lot size, he the code does anticipate a circle drive. I mean, so that's why you know we're supportive of some level of uh, impervious area relief because okay, he's got a large lot. We so and and. The code says, yeah, you can have a circle drive. Well, in this case, to do a circle drive, we, we think it needs to be a little smaller, but he still has to have some sort of relief. So that's why we're supportive of relief. We didn't, uh, be, because that, I mean, that was really our thinking. We didn't really get into the, um, well, how's he going to use it? You know, um, we don't have a history of enforcement here. We've had some other cases where there has been a, a history where we know we have somebody that's been. Uh, parking uh, equipment, you know, trailers with equipment on it, maybe on grass, you know, some things that our enforcement staff, not planning staff, but enforcement staff are, have been having issues with. And in that case, you know, we have kind of brought that into the discussion that, and in those cases, they also weren't zoned and large lot that allows the circle driveway like he, like he is. So that, that's probably a long, long winded way of saying not in this case. Okay, so making sure they'll summarize. So what we're saying right now is, if we allow a circle drive, we currently have we can allow a circle drive. Awesome. If we allow a circle drive within parameters. We're looking at expanding those parameters. But you know, if all of a sudden enforcement comes down in a few months and says, "Hey, he can't have his work truck in front," will they be right, or they is his work they, truck being here allowed? I don't think it would be a matter of the work truck. It, I mean, it'd be if you had the, this, the trailer, a skid yep. loader sitting on a trailer, kind of thing. Let me address that right away. I don't like to see that in my, even behind my basketball hoop. You know, most of the time it is at the job site. Um, I do have a big yard in the back and I, I have a trailer back there, you know, for when I need a flatbed. Um, I don't want to see it any more than I have to. I like, you know, when I come up, I like a nice clean, as you can see from, you know, I have a nice metal gate. You know, I, I enjoy just, you know, a clean look. So I, I, I don't, in Not no way in the future. Yeah. And I, I could sell this house and the next guy was like, skid loader, let's put it there. Yeah. I get what you're saying. So. Yeah, well, I wasn't arguing that. I was, more, I was more making sure that we're conscious of step two if we do step one and say, hey, this is here. Let's make sure we're all on the same table. This, it doesn't become like a used car lot or anything. That's, yeah. I just want to make sure we're all on the same page there. So before we <laughs> get you frustrated <laughs> with us, and you said this is all right. <laughs> well, thank you. You did a wonderful job for your first time here. Thanks. Is there one, anyone in the audience who wishes to speak in favor of this item? Anyone in opposition? Carol Maher, Ward 3, zip code 50312. Um, at some point, we should think of less concrete rather than more. Um, we should also maybe recommend to the applicant about the programs that the city funds at 50% being rain gardens and rain barrels. 
that would help address the issue he's having with all the water coming down onto his patio and going to his house. And that circle is a perfect place for a rain garden because you're going to have nothing but water coming through there um, that's not going to be um, uh, rinsed through roots before it gets to the storm gutter. So I know you can't require someone to put in a rain garden that gets reimbursed at 50%, but it would sure do go a long way to help uh, mitigating all the new concrete that's going to go in his front yard. Thank you. Thanks, Carol. Is there anyone else in the audience who wishes to speak in opposition or neutral? All right, seeing none, you do have five minutes for rebuttal if you feel like you need it. Um, I'd like to say, tell me more about the rain guard. I'm curious. Um, and I don't really have the rain problem. I prevented that going forward with the future. That's, I maybe didn't explain it well, but I, the tiling and everything takes care of that, where I, you know, at, that was planned ahead of time at, before I did that. And uh, yeah, and then I've graded everything else away from the house. And so we're, I'm looking pretty good on that. Great, thank you. Answer to your question, just Google. Yeah, just. Des Moines Stormwater Management. And there's some contractors you can hit up. I'm one of them. Uh -huh. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> All right, does anyone have any further questions before I close the public hearing? All right, I'll close the public hearing and uh, what do we think? Would staff have major conniptions if this was approved at 12 foot as opposed to 10? No, I, I, um, I think I, we have some very strong reservations about what was proposed, but um, if the commission wants to do 12 feet or wherever you land, I mean, I, I think that's, it. percentage-wise, it's still fairly high, but just like the physical dimension, like just thinking 10 to 12 is not a whole lot difference, and I do recognize that you know, make the curve more achievable. So I, I, I think, you know, staff is not going to lose any sleep over that. I'd be supportive of that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah then I, I would like to move staff with the only modification being to allow 12 feet versus 10 feet wide. All right, there's a motion on the floor from Chris. All in favor, please raise your right hand. Like that's everyone? Yep, motion carries 10 0. Thank you. And number seven is our last item tonight. It is a request from 600 East 14th Street, LLC, represented by Jake Christensen for review and approval of public hearing site plan. Casey's at 600 East 14th for property at 600 East 14th for type two design alternatives A through F. And Nick will be presenting. Madam Chair, members of, the, or members of the Commission, Nick Tarpey, Planning Staff. Um, just kind of want to break down some of the design alternatives that we're looking at tonight. Probably read your staff report. There's a long list, so I kind of want to try to break that down of how we're going to go through the presentation. So the first five, or the first four on there, A through D, more, have more so to do with the building design. So some of those kind of nitty gritty architectural elements, we can talk about that a little bit. Should be a really nuanced discussion. I'm going to try to walk you guys through how, as staff, we worked through that with some of the site constraints and, and worked with the applicant. Um, so I'll, I'll try to explain that. It'll, it'll sh it should be good for some Q&A. We should have a good discussion about that. Uh, parts E and F relate more to the site, so they're a little bit different. Um, those are a little bit more clear cut, and you'll see that if you read the staff report, um, and also in the discussion, you'll see it's a little more of a clear cut type of recommendation. So here's an aerial of the site. It's highlighted here in yellow. Um, as you can see, it's bounded by 235 to the north. We got East 14th, US 69 to the east. We got Des Moines Street to the south and some institutional uses to the west. I also wanted to include a little bit of more of a zoomed out aerial to give you a little bit uh, greater context here. If you're following my cursor, um, the cursor represents pretty roughly, I did a rough measurement, it's about a half mile in terms of radius. So if we're thinking about things like walk sheds, um, keep that in mind as we're talking about this item tonight. I also want to point out a couple of landmarks. So this here, this is East High. So it's located uh, about a quarter mile north. They do have to cross 235. So it's not necessarily a friendly walk, but it is relatively close uh, to the proposed site. 
down here the state capital, and then we have the accompanying capital complex right here. And then over here we have the East Grand Commercial Corridor, has the quick trip and, and a lot of businesses that people frequent. Um, so we can dig into some of those elements and how they might play into the site that we're looking at tonight. So digging into the site plan here, a couple different views. I'll stop on this one. So um, another thing that I did want to mention too, uh, if this site looks familiar, maybe you've seen it before, this actually was in front of the commission back in January. It was rezoned. So initially, or before, um, this, this project kicked off. It was zoned P2, so really for public, civic, institutional type uses, kind of um, incongruence with the surrounding capital complex. Uh, the property was rezoned to MX3, so like a mi heavier mixed-use uh, commercial district with the intent to eventually construct a fuel station, which is what you're seeing tonight. So that was the zoning history back in January. Now, fast forward, we're at the site plan stage, and they're trying to actually develop it and build this out. So I know we talked a lot about the storefront uh, building regulations earlier tonight. Um, this, this building also takes on the storefront form in a little bit of a different zoning district, so it's MX3 versus an MX1, so a little bit more of a heavier commercial. Uh, a lot of the same intent of the storefront building still applies, so really trying to get it sited close to the corner, close to both of the frontages here, trying to orient the parking uh, towards the rear, um, having a lot of primary uh, frontage coverage, so really, um, in this case, the Des Moines Street is considered a primary frontage, and so really uh, trying to have the building cover a large expanse of that to really create a, a hardened pedestrian edge, a true urban edge, um, especially in an area, if you walk through there, it, it doesn't really have that right now. And so um, really with the relatively thin site um, and with the use that's proposed as a fuel station, there was really a lot of nuance that had to be had in the discussions that staff had with the applicant. There was some design decisions that really had to be made we really had to sit down with the applicant and decide, okay, is what is proposed meeting the intent uh, of the zoning ordinance? Um, and generally, because of all the things that I just described, uh, staff generally does feel that it does. You know, we're, we're citing the building close to the corner. Um, we've got a, a decent amount of, we, it meets the primary frontage coverage requirement. We've got parking uh, located in the, behind the building uh, generally, you know, before they, it was actually stretched uh, more to front uh, East 14th Street. The applicant has adjusted that, trying to reduce the impervious uh, surface area as much as possible. Um, so generally, uh, staff felt like that, you know, hey, we, you've, they've worked with us a little bit, we've tried to get a building that we want and, and a site that contextually is kind of hard to develop to try to develop something super walkable. With all that being said, um, there were some elements, particularly on the building's facade, that did not conform to some of the provisions in the planning design ordinance. So I'm going to flash forward here to some of the elevations, see if I can zoom in, see that a little bit easier. So um, what you're looking at right now, so these, this is the proposed building design. This is the south facade of the building, so this is the facade that would be facing Des Moines Street. Um, on the surface, looks pretty good. It's, it's got a lot of glazing, materials are good, it's got an entrance. Um, the big thing that, that staff noted, though, was that most of the glass, or ex almost exclusively all of the glass, um, on the south as well as the east facades of the building, so if you're thinking about how the building squares the corner there, the ones that face the street, they utilize spandrel glass. Um, per the design ordinance, in terms of uh, having ground story transparency that faces the street, transparency is designed as glass that has a reflectance factor of no more than 0.25 and a transmittance factor of greater than 50%. So really, kind of in layman's terms, what that means is really we want vision glass, where the occupants inside of the building are really able to interact with the, the street realm, and everybody that's walking in the street can see inside of the building. It's kind of promote a a walkable, pedestrian-oriented environment that's not really supposed to mimic a blank wall. Um, there was really some operational constraints um, per the Casey's team and, and as staff, we really went back and forth on this and we discussed it, that um, really didn't really make it make sense to uh, have a lot of vision glass on the south and the uh, eastern facades of the building. And really that's because of uh, the floor plan and just really the operational constraints and the realities of, of building a fuel station um, as well as a retail sales uh, food service type establishment. So what you're looking at right here um, is a perspective floor plan of what they're proposing. So if you're following my cursor, this side here, this is the side that faces to the north towards the fuel pumps. Um, and staff, as we were looking at this, um, while we, we did uh, push them to really site the building close to both street frontages and to the corner um, to try to promote a pedestrian-oriented environment, we also acknowledge at the same time we're located less than a quarter mile south of 235. As, as much as we love promoting walkable type environments, there are realities that we're on East 14th Street, there's three lanes of southbound traffic, um, there's fuel pumps here, so it is really gonna be an auto-oriented type use. And so we understand that 
just because of the way that the building is. It's got two frontages. It's got to have two public entrances that the applicant really had to place the back of the building um, towards the Des Moines Street facade and had to really put the quote unquote front of the building so where you would have your checkout, where you'd be buying your goods, where you'd be picking up your pizza, those types of things. That would be facing towards the fuel pumps on the north side and that's where um, a lot of that vision glass was proposed. Um, that I do want to also note, uh, you do see the entrance here that is um, facing the Des Moines Street facade. Uh, that is a public entrance, so uh, the applicant you know, did comply with that. That was something early on that was kind of a gray area, and through discussions with the applicant, they were um, okay with allowing this as a public entrance. Um, the, the main entrance to the building, however, is, is really on the north side, facing those fuel pumps like I talked about earlier. So to summarize all that, I know it was rambling a little bit. There was really just some design decisions that had to be made. You know, how are we really meeting the intent of the ordinance? Um, there's going to have to be some sacrifices, a little bit of give and take to try to get what we want to improve the pedestrian nature and, and the walkability of the area, but while also acknowledging because of the use, uh, because of the context, there are some legitimate site realities at play here. With all that being said, too, um, I think staff was, was generally supportive of the idea of using spandrel glass on both the street-facing facades, even if it didn't meet our quote-unquote transparency requirements. We thought that would be better than um, having vision glass on those street-facing facades that just showcased a bunch of coolers and mechanical equipment. That wasn't really something that we wanted to promote um, on the sidewalk. Uh, but, and at the same time, we also didn't want to just have a long, blank brick wall. And so we really had to make a compromise. We thought spandrel grass, glass was appropriate in that sense. So that's the basis for that part of the staff recommendation. The one thing that I did want to get into, though, that, that staff is asking of the applicant, and that really is sort of tasked with the, to the commission tonight to discuss and, and lead us down that path, is the entrance here. Um, and I, we went back, applicant and myself and our team, we went back and forth with this. Um, because of the utilization of spandrel glass on most of the facade, um, we would want to see um, a little bit more of a, a pronunciation with this entrance here. Um, we understand that it is a public entrance, it is going to be open during store hours, um, but we would like to see some more features that would elevate it as a public entrance. If you're working at the state capitol complex, or if you are um, living in the neighborhood on the other side of East 14th, or you're, maybe you're walking down from East High School, um, we want this to be pronounced and, and say, hey, you can come in me right now. Um, this, while it is a public entrance, uh, staff doesn't feel that um, in terms of the principal entryway requirements, um, in terms of some of the architectural elements that could be included, that that was really taken strongly enough. And so that's one of the main tasks of the commission tonight um, is to decide if, that, if staff's position is appropriate on that. So in the staff recommendation in the report, uh, you'll notice that staff has, hasn't really issued a super firm recommendation with that, but we've, we've said there's a, a variety of elements that you can include, like a double door, or maybe adding a canopy, or maybe some, some lights, or some other architectural features that would really delineate that as, hey, this is a primary public entrance. It's not just the back of the building, um, even though functionally it, it actually is. So kind of moving into part two of the staff recommendation here, or the staff report. Um, the other couple of design alternatives were for the utilization of rock um, as a ground cover material, as well as the trash enclosure gates, so a little bit more of a, a site plan item in terms of the site design elements. Um, getting into, and I'm going to scroll in the staff report here, sorry about that. Um, so just digging into the staff recommendation, um, I tried to run through some of that workflow and some of the nuance that uh, staff was, was trying to reach with the applicant. Um, the other two items, one being the rock and two being the trash enclosure gates. Regarding the rock, um, per our landscaping ordinance just generally, a rock is not a permitted ground cover material. So um, per chapter 135, article 7, section 3, generally um, all sites should be covered with either grass, hardscape, um, or like an organic cover, like a, like a wood chip mulch or something like that. So rock, just in general, is not allowed to be used as a general ground cover or in planting beds. And there's really like four main reasons for that. The first one would be uh, a drainage mechanism. So talking to our engineering department, really rock does not have the same, um, basically the same qualities as like soil um, or grass or vegetation. Um, and flooding is a pretty sensitive thing in Des Moines, so in terms of stormwater management, uh, staff doesn't really feel it's appropriate to be approving um, rock to be developed on new, new construction sites like the one that you're seeing today. So that was the first and foremost issue. Uh, second one would be impacts on trees and landscaping. So uh, rock really does not promote a hospitable environment for tree root growth, um, as well as other types of landscaping. It's not going to last as long, it's more likely to die. 
Um, especially, we haven't had a lot of rain this summer, so you can imagine what a new tree would, would be doing in a bed of uh, recently placed rock. Third, um, more of a traffic perspective. It's actually thought of as a safety concern, especially if it's in the right of way or even near the right of way. It can trickle out of there. Um, if you guys have been maybe in some other sites around the city, there's some planter beds that do have rock. Those were kind of legacy planter beds that may have been approved before the adoption of the, the new zoning code in 2019. But rock, it, it skips out of there all the time. It gets on the sidewalk, it gets on the streets, it's a tripping hazard. It's a hazard for motorcyclists and bicyclists. Um, and so we, as, as staff, our position, you know, planning staff as well as traffic and transportation staff, we don't feel that that's appropriate um, in a multimodal type environment. And then lastly also, um, and this is more of an anecdotal piece, but our traffic staff has noted that rocks are oftentimes used maybe as projectiles. People pick them up and throw them. Um, and it's, that's not really something that we want to promote, especially with an, a new construction type development. Getting into the other side item with the trash enclosure. Um, this one's pretty simple. So uh, with, in the city of Des Moines, for new trash enclosures, you're required to utilize 18 gauge metal gates, which is really just a more durable metal. That's really what it comes down to. The applicant is propose, proposing a 24 gauge metal. Um, this is really not um, an aesthetic item. I, I know a lot of times some of these uh, design alternatives might seem really subjective or uh, aesthetic. The main concern here with staff is it's really a durability piece. Um, anecdotally, talking to zoning enforcement staff, they have problems all the time with trash enclosure gates. I think with the enclosure that they're uh, proposing in terms of the wall, they got masonry, it's going to be nice. Uh, there's not really a question of the durability with that, but it's the gates. Um, they get bumped into a lot. Uh, as you know, in Iowa, we have a lot of different weather conditions, extreme temperatures, snow, things like that. Um, and this, this site is going to have heavy use of a trash enclosure. It's a fuel station. It's probably going to be pretty busy. It's a high traffic corridor. They're also selling food, so there's going to be people going in and out of there all the time. And so with that heavy use, um, staff really, really notes that, hey, we should be using the, the code compliant 18 gauge metal. And just historically as well, um, staff, uh, you know, sometimes as you guys know, we, we have the type one design alternative process where staff can consider some elements um, at an administrative level. Uh, trash enclosures fall into the landscaping section of city code. So everything in there is really at least initially considered as a type one design alternative. With pre-existing sites, a lot of times staff were we're sensitive to that. You know, we understand, hey, you know, maybe you're just making some changes to the building, doing some site improvements. OK, we can kind of compromise and be a little bit flexible on, on what trash enclosure you're proposing. But with this as a new construction site, um, staff feels that we should fully implement the provisions of the zoning code. And that would be an 18 gauge panel over the 24 gauge. So just to summarize, um, parts A through D, so those were the, the building elements that we talked about earlier relating to the transparency some of the occupied space requirements, as well as some of the entryway requirements. Um, staff recommending, recommends a, approval of the site plan and, and those design alternative requests subject to a revised submittal coming in from the applicant that would demonstrate some of those alternative or additional architectural items that they could utilize with that uh, entrance that's facing Des Moines Street. Uh, but then switching gears into the site stuff uh, regarding the provision of the rock as well as the trash enclosure gates, uh, we're recommending denial of those items. So I can take any questions. I, pause. I, I do have one concern. I understand that we may not always be on the same page here, but the, the, the rock one bothers me aggressively because the last time that we actually brought this up, the projectile piece, is brought up without evidence, is also brought up as being the source of BLM breaking windows with a 20,000 foot-pound brake le limit, which is non-factual, nonsensical, which makes me wonder if we're actually proposing something here as fact that is just not real. That part seems bothersome to me. If they kill trees, fine. If we don't like, like them because we don't like the look, fine, even though we have them in a bunch of places. But I really hope we can end that projectile discussion because it seems like it was grounded in like social bias than it was in fact. Um, that, that was really problematic at the time, and it seems crazy to say it again. OK, that was in discussions, anecdotal discussions with the traffic and transportation staff. I know what the item that was talking anecdotal about. Anecdotal was in not fact. Yeah, right? and yeah. so I, under okay. I understand that. And I, I wanted to clarify that when I was presenting it. I, I and I don't, I, I don't yeah. think it's the basis of our recommendation. Yeah. So I, I would just park that to the side. The basis of our recommendation is our design standards don't allow it. Um, there's re other reasons that have been mentioned as to why. And I, that's our recommendation. Are there other questions? So I guess 
you still want to keep the site walkable, correct? Um, what, what was your concerns on that south side when it came to glass and uh, door access? Can you? Can you yeah, sure. Again? So let me go back to the elevations here. Try to walk Nick, through that. Nick, while you're scrolling back, I'll go ahead and chime in a little bit on what we were thinking. What we're looking for, we recognize that the, that facade uh, is a lot of back of house operations. So there's not, and there, there's not going to be. Um, from our perspective, it's reasonable not to have as much glass as our code would normally re require for a storefront building. However, we think there needs to be more emphasis on that entrance. And primarily, what our thoughts were were either um, like a a double door, uh, this door with maybe two windows on either side, transom window above it um, would help as well, especially you know bringing it up to the height of the spandrel glass so it just doesn't feel so um, backside of a, you know, secondary of an entrance. Those were our thoughts. So would a comparable be like Cedar Rapids, for example, as a case, that sort of as a double side. So you're basically just saying, hey, if you put in double set, double doors on the side, since that is the primary road, we're happy. Is that the gist? Yeah, I, I think it might help to have like a transom above it just to give it more presence. I mean, when you look at this door, how short it, it is compared to the, the faux windows. But, and I, and I think those solutions would have minimal impact on the interior layout layout and might impact a little bit of the storage rooms. Um, and, and I know there's a cooler to the right of that door, but I mean, we'll let the, that's why we wrote the staff recommendation open-ended so we could continue to have dialogue. We, we didn't want to come here today and say, you've got to absolutely do this. These are what we're saying. So here's a couple ideas, work with us on it and we'll get it figured out. So we're looking to at least put an awning above that door and then maybe two I, I don't know about an awning. I think that was just, uh, I think really what we're looking for is mostly glass. Uh, I think um, on, you know, that certainly if the applicant had a sense of how they would do that, I, I wouldn't want it to just necessarily be the door and kind of have to encompass the whole thing. So that, I don't know that they'll want to do that. But to me, really what's important is the, the del you know, the additional glass to give that a stronger presence so when I'm walking by or driving by, I really feel like I can go in and out that entrance. You know, when it's like this, I, I don't know, it feels, a, a, just doesn't, um, I don't think it's gonna naturally draw people. All right, so I have one more question. This is the current proposal. Staff would like to see that the windows were see-through. Is that correct as well? So is that like a more, yeah, the, the additional around the door. So the door, you can see that it says vision. So we're just we're just saying in that area of the door, in a very limited area, do clear glass or you know vision glass. Leave this, you know, it, it would impact depending on how you treat that. It's going to impact the other rib, you know, those ribbons of spandrel to the either direction. But for the largely large part, those would all stay intact. So those centralized windows. Those five windows essentially be see-through. Maybe remove one window yeah, and yeah, put yeah, a no. second. Um, actually, go to the floor. Go yeah. to the floor plan if you yep. would, Nick. Sorry. And the only reason why I'm pressing on this, I I went to East High School. Uh -huh. That place is very, very, very high traffic traffic during a lunch hour. So you'll have people walking and visiting. And definitely from the south end, there's a bunch of apartments as well. Uh, they currently frequent Quick Trip, but I can see them spending their dollars there at Casey's. So I guess my real concern is I, I wanted to make sure it's safe for high school kids to be able to get that access, that space, and those people from the apartments. That's my only gripe. Okay. So that's why I'm trying to dig well, down did, and figure out sure. what, and if what this is going to look like. If you zoom into that kind of the front door, uh, not excuse me, the back door area along the street, just so we, just a little bit more, slide it over. There, there we go. You can kind of see where you have the rhythm of the three spandrel windows to your left and the ribbon of the two to the right. To do what staff is asking for, you know, that area that says hallway, you know, that some of that is going to have to get, it would be, that had to be kind of widened out. Those, you might lose one or two of the spandrel pieces, but in that area, that central area to immediately around the door, whether it's a double door, or it's a single door with side lights and the transom, you're just getting a little more glass in that middle. Does that make sense to you? Yes. All right, thank you, Nick. Very well done. Um, is the applicant present? Yes. 
Please state your name, address, you have 10 minutes, and sign in when you're done. My name is Daniel Wilrick. I'm with Pelz Design Services at 2323 Dixon Street, and uh, we're working with Casey's to get this project done. Um, staff has been really good to work with to get to this point. Um, we're glad that we were able to have a, a discussion around the expander glass because, I mean, clearly we could put in clear glass, but you'd see a side of a cooler, so that's, you know, probably not ideal either, right? So. Um, one of the ways that we do the spandrel glass to help, I don't know how familiar you guys are with it, but a traditional spandrel glass is one pane of glass painted on the back and it doesn't even look like glass. The way we do it is we use a one inch insulated glass, paint the very back surface so that it has a closer look to what clear glass would during the day when you're getting that reflection from the sunlight and things. So I think from a, you know, unless you're right up on it or at night, it, it'll generally give you that feel of, of, of a glass window like you would see on the front of the building. Um, in terms of precedent, we did something very similar on uh, the Forest Avenue uh, non-fuel site a year or two ago. I can't remember how long ago that was, but um, we had the same discussion, came to the same conclusion in a couple locations on that site. So um, I think you know, we're good with uh, the compromise of the spandrel glass. Um, I think when it comes to the rear entrance, um, we do have a few more limitations just because um, obviously, Casey's has a plan that they use that works for their operation. Um, they spend a lot of time developing that. Changing it becomes very problematic. Um, I know we're talking about minor changes, but the reality is, too, the way Casey's buys their projects is they buy them ahead. So, you know, it theoretically, I don't know specifically for this project, but theoretically, 75% of that building could be sitting in their warehouse already, just waiting for the go to bring it out, or on their in their vendor's yard. So. That's why um, typically when we talk about these Casey's projects, we want to work with the city, but we also want to try to stay as true to the, pro to, or the, the, the sort of standard as we can for those reasons. Um, one thing I do want to show, let's see, I'm going to just scroll back to our, so that's the north side. Where's my south? I'm going to get my south elevation because I just want to show what the standard south elevation looks like before we do anything to it. And when we talk about how Casey's has accommodated this idea about an entrance on the south side of the building, you can see, you know, in this case, there's, I have to wait for Nick to stop moving before I can move. You know, we, we've basically recreated the other side of the building, just slightly smaller, um, you know, with the stone columns on either side, the big Casey's logo. This portion of it does project out from the face of the building a foot or two, not quite as far as the other side, just because of our location relative to the property line. Um, so we've done all those things to uh, bring up the quality of the entrance of this side. And I just want to show you if I can get the, I guess in school they call them Elmos. Yeah. Had we not, had we built the prototype as is, this is kind of, and this one isn't cool and colored, but this is what the back would look like. Very, it's a big brick wall. It's got all our electrical utilities. It's got the minimal door with the kind of, you know, minimal canopy and a little signage. So I think when we talk about has Casey's gone to the effort to improve the look of that side of the building to go from that to what we have here, we've certainly gone a long ways to do that. Um, not that saying asking for more isn't something that we you do. I think um, I just think we're we're hesitant to to make any more changes to that side that would affect the layout even minimally because again with the way they buy their stores that cooler is a set size that back room on the other side is already very tight you know we might start getting into some accessibility issues if we tighten things up anymore um, the uh, there is a little bit of room in that hallway but you know, we've got a little shaft wall a little shaft in that one corner that's housing some utilities for the um, for the cooler condensers and things so it's not so easy to just sort of take over that hallway space. I think, you know, maybe putting a little transom window over the top of the door so that it kind of mimics what's on the north side because there are transoms over that is pretty minimal and something that could be done. Um, but I think if you look at where we were to where we are and add that little transom, um, I think Casey's has come a long ways to, to accommodating that. Um, to the point that uh, Justin made about the, the kids coming over from east 
I was a kid once. I wasn't gonna. I wouldn't walk all the way around to Des Moines Street. I'd cut across the fuel lot and walk in that north door, right? So that's where I'm coming in as a kid coming from east. This is really serving the folks that might walk over from the Capitol building um, or par parts to the south, right? So, um, so really, I guess that's where I would be at with the um, with the architectural elements. I mean, really, I think we're um, in agreement with what staff said. I think. You know, it, our offering to the request of a little more work back there would be that transom above the door versus a double door or some side lights, <clears throat> which, yeah. Um, in terms of the site items, the, the rock in the, um, the planning bed, I think, as we were putting that together, we looked across the street at the McDonald's, which I think was, from what our site, my site guy told me today, was, was done after the new site planning, um, at least was built after the new site um, zoning ordinances were in place. Maybe it was approved before, but it was certainly built after, and they have rock in their planting bed with some ornamental grasses. And we're talking about rock in a planting bed with some um, hedge, hedges to form that sort of visual, a little bit of a visual barrier. So I think, um, you know, we'd like to keep the rock, you know, forced to do something different. Um, I'm told that um, brick chips would be a, a reasonable alternative from our standpoint. Um, I think. Anything else, mulch or whatever, just becomes very maintenance heavy. So, um, and then in terms of the uh, the steel gate, I mean, we're we're just we proposing what we've done in other locations for steel gates. Um, the thickness of the material. I mean, I get that desire for something more durable, but we're talking about Casey's here, who takes care of their properties because they understand that deferred maintenance doesn't pay. Um, so even if it is a little bit thinner gauge material, they're going to take care of it. Um, I guess I'm speaking for Casey's. I, and that's what I would. That's what I've seen from them. Um, I know Nick Day sent Nick Tarpey some images of some other locate another location in Des Moines, which is the typical. Uh, Can you flip back to the computer, Glory. Should be on these. Yeah, there we go. I mean, it's visually, it's not going to change anything. Um, I think it's just a, again, it's that component of. Casey's buys these buildings over and over and out ahead um, so that when it's time to go, they can go. Because the faster they get it open, the faster they can start serving the community and, and start generating revenue. So, you know, we'd certainly like to keep it as what we typically do for that reason. Casey's is going to take care of their properties. They typically do. So um, I guess we'd ask you to kind of waive the recommendation on, on the, the, the steel gate. So did I hit everything? Eric. Any questions? Yes. Um, what are the the pedestrians that are walking's access points? Can you show that on a map? So if they were coming from the north and the south, how would that look? So essentially, if they're yeah, if they're coming from East High School, how are they going to? What's the quickest way to you? And is it safe? I would speculate. I know if I was a high school kid who's trying to get to lunch as quick as I can, I would probably come across on this sidewalk and cut, potentially cut right through here to this front door. Um, but could you describe the, the preferred way? Even if, even if they stayed on the sidewalk, there is a stair here leading to the sidewalk, right? So that's, that's the... Yeah, that was my yeah, question. That's the, you're right, that's the path that we're, we're providing for them, whether that's the path they take Oh yeah, yeah, no, no. I just was. I wanted to see if there was a cutout. Um, and then yeah, if you go to the, if we go to the south, I mean, they're coming up the side. People are coming up the sidewalk, to the sidewalk, probably on Des Moines Street, and in this door that we've been talking about. Okay. And then my last question was, what were you proposing on that that south side? Were you looking to expand that door to make more vision space, or you just want to keep the single door and the? I mean, from an operational standpoint. Based on the plan of the building, um, we don't have a lot of room to make it much wider. I mean, the best we could do is a four-foot door instead of a three-and-a-half-foot door. It's already a wider door than a typical door. I mean, it is a three-and-a-half-foot door. Um, what I was suggesting is we could put this, what they call a transom window, the smaller window, above the door, and that could be clear. Um, to bring it up, I guess, you know, architecturally on that side of the building, that would put the top of that door at the same level as the top of the windows, that the spandrel glass windows that we're proposing. So. You know, aesthetically, that would make sense, um, regardless. So, but that little shaft in the corner, you know, there is some utilities and there are some, 
I say utilities, but there are some things in there that service that cooler. So it's that's not just there to take up some space. It's actually hiding that so that it doesn't become a damaged as you know folks walk through that space. So we don't have a ton of, I mean, you're not gonna get a double door in there. You barely get a double door in there, I would guess, even if you had didn't have that shaft. Um, like I said, a slightly wider door maybe, but that door is already six inches wider than a typical door, so. And that is that is a typical um, Casey's detail on their rear door stores is that door to be a little bit wider. Is there a significant difference, different business model for this Casey's versus one on 8th Street in Cedar Rapids, which does have two double-sided doors and really does have two entries, which is what you sort of have here. You have pedestrian side and fuel side. They have a similar situation. Is there something significantly different that means that Casey's wouldn't be able to accommodate that for some reason? Well, yeah, I mean, Casey's does have a few different models of store that they put out there, and, you know, they, they, they do their market research to understand potential uh, traffic, you know, customer traffic, Revenue, size of site makes a difference. You know, this site, that building, I would, I don't know exactly which building you're talking about, but I would guess it's a little bit bigger building than this one is, which then does allow for a wider rear door. Um, if you look at their truck stop model, yeah, they've got double doors on both sides, but we're talking huge sites. Right? No, so. it's 8th Street, it's at the top end of Nubo Co., so it's at or Nubo District, so it is probably almost the exact same width on this thing, I would assume. Yeah, I guess I didn't. I wasn't part of that project, so I'm not sure. But I know that um, they do they do look at different sites in different ways and have different models they'll put on them. And this is the one that fits this site from their perspective. And um, so that's the that's the single door rear door in this case. Do you have any other sites that you're not using rock for ground cover? That we're not using rock. I mean, I would, yeah, I mean, I'm not familiar with every single site. I would guess there are sites that don't have anything, sites that uh, use something other than rock. Um, I think from, from our standpoint, rock is just a, uh, the, is an easier from a maintenance standpoint. So that would be the preference. All right, any other questions? Thank you. Mm-hmm. I don't think there's anyone in the audience. Uh, you're not speaking, right? Okay. So, um, unless there's questions for staff, um, are there any questions? All right, I'm gonna close the public hearing. Oh. Have we ever, so we're requiring 24 gauge. Has that ever been approved? Or have we ever required them to do it and they've completed it? Uh, Jason can butt in. I think we have approved 24 gauge gates, but that's typically been like at a pre-existing site where like maybe they have an existing building, they're doing some site improvements, they're upgrading their trash enclosure. I think we have allowed that in the past. Um, but the historic position of staff, if you're doing a new build like this, you should comply with Article 7, which would require 18 gauge. So come and go on 31st is 18 versus 24. That was also approved before the most recent zoning ordinance. And I, it had I, a different. I think, um, yeah, it's hard to. I don't. I don't. We couldn't say for sure, mm -hmm. um, but it was under the old zoning ordinance. Right. I believe the gate gauge requirements have, were static and came through. Bert, does that sound right to you? I'm not asking you for you to tell me for sure. I just need you to be like that. Sounds right. <laughs> yeah. Oh. Yeah, just say that. Yeah. <laughs> Sounds very I'm, That's my recollection is that the, the gate, the gauge of the gate, that discussion is something that we've had as a standard for a long time. Um, and we pulled that through. What like, happened to be new in the newer code was the fact that we actually have landscape specific requirements for um, dumpster enclosures. The, the other thing that we do for flexibility purposes with an existing site is that. Um, you know, if it's like an older apartment building or a, a small commercial building and they're not doing a whole lot of work, we'll actually let them do like a metal framed walls that have Trex boards and then the gates are still the steel. So there's a lot of flexibility, like Nick mentioned, for existing sites doing incremental improvements where we view new development a little differently. 
What's a Casey's on Forest? Um, I believe it's 24. Um, is that? Yeah. Yeah, that was the photo that they showed, and that was 24 gauge. All right, so we do have 24s. We did approve 24 before for the exact same company that was just recently done, too. That's correct. It was like about a year and a half ago. Okay. Do we, um, never mind, I'll talk. It, All right. How long have we been, how long has Casey been working on this site? They had a pre-application, I think, in late 2020, correct me if I'm wrong. So that's kind of like an initial scoping meeting to figure out, hey, we're interested in the site. Um, the rezoning, like I mentioned, w went before you guys in January of this year. It was passed by council in February. They submitted their site plan, I think, late March. And now we're at this point um, in mid-August. All right, thanks, Nick. All right, I'm going to close the public hearing officially. And uh, what are your thoughts for a motion? I'd like to move staff except for E and F. We have 24 gauge on the exact same type of building, just been done. And the E piece on the rock, right across the street is rock. The rock argument before seems like it's shallow. So I'm open friendly amendment, but I would move staff less E and F. I do agree strongly with the double door on the, on the, on the far side. That is, that's the primary frontage if we're talking about walkability and what we've been attempting to do and invest in the city. Is that a motion? Yes, yes. Okay. I, well, I, I would like to, to hear all night. <laughs> make a friendly amendment. Uh, I, I would agree with, if you are removing the, the rock um, uh, waiver, I would like to add that back in. I do think it um, adds a safety component with all that traffic that's on East 14th uh, and assuming that there will be a lot of pedestrian traffic as well from the high school. So if, uh, if you would be willing to accept the friendly amendment to add the, um, the staff recommendation to not approve the rock. Yeah, so I, I, I'm cool with that. So modifying the motion to say I approve or move staff less F. So Correct. F would, yep, yep, happy with that. I mean, I think that's a good amendment. I mean, you th high, when we think of high school kids, we linger. I mean, I, when I was a high school kid, I would linger and we would just fool around, shoot the stuff and kick rocks and I, I, I feel like it's a good safety concern and a good adjustment. Casey's, we love you guys, we appreciate you, but uh, yeah, I see people riding bikes and motorcycles through there. I, I'm east side true and true, so. Yeah, safety-wise, I'd, I'd like to keep that. All right, I agree with that as well. Can see we pe see people shaking their heads? Chris, can you clarify in your motion what the solution is for the door on the Des Moines Street side? I think what staff is is that Casey's has to come back with a design change that is approved by, that staff is okay with. I, I was saying there that my preference is a double door with glass or a top that would actually look like what 8th Street in uh, Cedar Rapids is, but I don't think we're tied to that. I think we're giving staff flexibility on that to say, hey, come okay. back with something we approve, we're okay with. We would still require it not to be rock, but with F cut means that you can do 24 gauge from okay. tracking. Is that? Yeah, that no, I, that's what I take from your motion, and uh, I also pick from the direction that um, your preference for us as we visit is to explore double door or a window and, and not just settle on a transom above the door like they offered, because otherwise you could have... My... That's my preference, but I'm also an engineer, so I understand when you cut yeah. stuff yeah. It is, is where that's it is. That's where we'll but, start yeah. as staff, unless they can prove otherwise. So. All right, motion on the floor. From Chris, um, all in favor, please raise your right hand. And that's everyone. Motion carries 10-0. Any director's reports or anything, Jason? Uh, nope, not tonight. Thank you. All right, we're adjourned.